emanating from www.michaelnimmons.com. It's the Thinking Out Loud radio show, giving voice to issues that matter to you. This is Michael Eric Dyson. This is Rochelle Riley, straight out of Detroit. This is Dr. Victoria Dooley at Dr. Dooley MD. What up, everybody? It's your boy, comedian Jay Stevens. This is Frederick D. Haynes III. I am Justin Coates, an author and anti-bullying activist. I am Pam Perry. Hey, everybody. This is Rochelle V. Mann, CEO of Man Made Productions. This is Bree Diane, international evangelist. Hey, this is Candace Pretty Strange Smith. And what's up? This is Ty Scott King. I was cracking Planet Earth. It's your boy Griff, comedian, author, motivational speaker, entrepreneur, philanthropist, but a Jesus Christ lover. You understand me? And you're listening to Thinking Out Loud Radio with my homeboy, Michael Nemeth. Check him out right here. Go ahead, Mike. Give him that good, good. I want you to give a warm Thinking Out Loud Radio Show welcome to Emmy Award winning WXYZ Channel 7 anchor woman and new friend of the show, Miss Carolyn Clifford. Well, thank you, Michael, and what a nice introduction. So happy to be here. You know what I've got to do. i got to check out my man, Michael Nimmons, who is handling his business as he drops that knowledge. I like that because Frederick Douglass, for whom I'm named, says that knowledge unfits us for slavery. Truth sets us free. If you want to be free, you want to be like Mike. Check out the best radio show online. You're locked in right now to our listening. You're tuned into the... And without thinking about it, guess what? I'm thinking out loud right here on a Thinking Out Loud radio show. And if you want to stay in the know, you better be listening to Thinking Out Loud radio show. You're listening to the Thinking Out Loud radio show. Check out Thinking Out Loud. Thinking Out Loud radio show. <laughs> Thinking Out Loud radio show. Don't you dare touch that dial. The Thinking Out Loud radio show with Michael Nimmin. Featuring author, motivational speaker, and minister, Michael Nimmin. If there is anyone out there who still doubts that America is a place where all things are possible, who still wonders if the dream of our founders is alive in our time, who still questions the power of our democracy, tonight is your answer. I I titled it The Promised Land because even though we may not get there in our lifetimes, even if we experience hardships and disappointments along the way, uh, that I at least still have faith we can uh, create a more perfect union. Not a perfect union, but a more perfect union. A Promised Land Presidential Memoir Book Club Series brought to you by The Thinking Out Loud Radio Show. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Thinking Out Loud radio show. And I'm your host, author, motivational speaker, and minister, Michael Nemens. You're tuned in to the show that's giving voice to issues that matter to you. We're so very excited, guys, to be back with another brand new edition of the Thinking Out Loud radio show. Again, this is the uh, Promised Land Presidential Memoir Book Series Edition. 
of the Thinking Out Loud radio show. We're continuing our discussion on tonight of President Obama's legacy as well as his new book, A Promised Land. I hope you enjoyed last week's discussion. And um, if you haven't uh Listen to it, Jack. You're brand new to the show. Just tuning in. You can listen to it at our website, michaelnimmons.com, or any of the major podcasting networks like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Tune in. Uh, again, our website, michaelnimmons.com, radio.com. The Detroit Praise Network is also available there. Uh, we encourage you to check it out and let us know what you think. And again, we're going to be talking more about it during tonight's show. In addition to the podcast on tonight, guys, uh, as we said last week, we're going to be doing something a little different. At the close of tonight's show, we're going live on Instagram at 930 for what we're calling the after show. And uh, we're looking to talk to you, uh, the listeners of the Thinking Out Loud radio show, and get your feedback about uh, President Obama's book, A Promised Land, his legacy, and much more. We want to talk about uh, the inauguration that's coming up uh, Tomorrow, January 20th, uh, President-elect Joe Biden and President, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris are going to be inaugurated as the new administration. And uh, we're saying bye to the old administration and good riddance. And uh, we can't move on fast enough. <laughs> uh, it's just um, exciting, an exciting time uh, for our country to be moving forward and turning the page to a new administration, a new chapter in American history and I'm looking forward to it and tonight we're going to be talking more about that uh, during the podcast and hopefully during the live show uh, the after show on Instagram to follow us uh, or to be a participant in that you got to follow us at TOL Radio Host MSN TOL Radio Host MSN we decided to do this because you know, our show is pre-recorded, our podcast. We pre-recorded and uploaded at 8 o'clock so you, the listeners, can tune in. But aside from um, commenting on social media, uh, making posts and whatnot, uh, you really are not able to interact with the show. And we're always looking for ways to uh, engage the listeners of the Thinking Out Loud radio show. And guys, we have over 25,000 streams and downloads. So there our listeners we are have our show has been uh, listened to uh, uh, 25,000 times there about uh, in the four years that we have been doing the show so we, there are listeners and uh, we're certainly would like to engage our listeners and uh, we look we look we're, we're looking for uh, you know better ways to do that and and uh, we we're given the idea uh, to do an after show and uh, I'm excited I really am and and, and this is going to be the first of very of many shows like this where we'll be coming on at 930 after the podcast to get your thoughts and feedback and even come on with guests uh, that we've interviewed uh, for the podcast where you can talk to them directly uh, and interact with them uh, during the after show at 930. Guys, I'm excited about this. I really am. And I hope you are, too. It's another way for us to engage one another, for us to talk and to share with one one another and if you are interested in being a guest on the podcast uh, or, or be a part of the after show email us at contact at michaelnimmons.com now you don't have to email us if you just want to be a part of the after show but if you'd like to be a guest on the thinking out loud radio show send us an email at contact at michaelnimmons.com we would love to hear from you if you have a if you're an entrepreneur uh, you have a business that you want to promote and you want us to be a a part of it and a partner together email us at contact at michaelnimmons.com we are always looking to promote uh, businesses here in the community that's what this platform uh, has always been about and will continue to be about uplifting one another and uh, and sharing uh, testimonies and, and stories uh, on the show uh, with individuals that you may or may not even know uh, and uh, I, I again enjoy having this platform Platform, and I hope you enjoy tuning in each and every Tuesday at 8 p.m. And guys, again, 930 after the podcast is con concluded, we're going to be live on Instagram and we'll be able to talk to you directly. 
in addition to uh, our discussion of former President Barack Obama's book, A Promised Land and His Legacy, we're going to be sharing with you an excerpt from one of Dr. King's famous addresses entitled Paul's Letter to America. And I can't wait to share this with you during tonight's thought of the week in the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday uh, and our celebration of it and recognition of it on yesterday. Uh, we want to share that powerful thought of the week with you for tonight's show. Well, guys, we're getting ready to take our first break of the night. When we come back, we're getting right into our first topic of tonight's show, The First Black Family. You don't want to go anywhere. You're tuned in to one of the hottest radio shows online. It's the Thinking Out Loud radio show. We'll be right back. You're tuned in to The Thinking Out Loud. show giving voice to issues that matter to you hello my name is Maya Nimmons and I want you to listen to my dad Michael Nimmons on the Thinking Out Loud radio show every Tuesday at 8pm available everywhere you listen to your podcast and now available on the Detroit Praise Network website you better listen to that little girl the Thinking Out Loud radio show giving voice to issues that matter to you. Stephanie D. Sanders, award-winning singer, songwriter, author, voiceover artist, and more. Heard on shows like the Tom Joyner Morning Show and the Thinking Out Loud radio show. Book Stephanie D. Sanders to voice over your podcast or radio intros or commercials. Do yourself a favor and visit stephaniedsanders.com and upgrade your podcast or radio show by booking Stephanie D. Sanders. You'll definitely be glad that you did. Good friend of ours, iconic, legendary radio host right here in Detroit, John Mason. Welcome to the Thinking Out Loud radio show. Thank you, Pastor Michael, man. <laughs> out of a cloud and always listen to thinking it out loud it'll change your life it'll do it and every time you watch and listen it'll change your life every day tune in to the thinking out loud radio show every tuesday at 8 p.m with radio host michael nimmons available everywhere you listen to your podcast and now available for download on the detroit praise network app Who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you were insufficient? Who told you that you were a loser? Who told you that you were a failure? Who told you that you were deficient? Who told you that you were nothing? Who told you that you were worthless? Who told you that you had no value? Who told you that you were you to believe who told you that you were naked is a dynamic empowering and inspiring book about identity that is a definite must have pastor nimmons talks about an identity crisis that dates as far back as the garden of eden you don't want to miss these powerful insights into not just the problem of this identity crisis but the discovery of the spiritual solution Get your copy now, available on Amazon for just $14.95 or by visiting michaelnemons.com. Like a victim when you are already victorious. If you believe in social justice, if you believe that black lives matter, if you believe that voting will bring about a change in November, if you believe that Jesus Christ is king, then you need to be listening to the Thinking Out Loud radio show. I'm radio host Michael Nemens, and if all of your answers are yes, then you need to join me Tuesdays at 8 p.m. on the Thinking Out Loud radio show, available everywhere you listen to your podcast, including michaelnemons.com. The Thinking Out Loud radio show, giving voice to issues that matter to you. You're tuned in to the Thinking Out Loud radio show. Keep it locked, keep it locked, keep it locked. Could lead a Marty March. And that's what the young people here today and listening all across the country must take away from this day. 
You are America. Unconstrained by habit and convention. Unencumbered by what is, because you're ready to seize what ought to be. For everywhere in this country, there are first steps to be taken. There's new ground to cover. There are more bridges to be crossed. And it is you, the young and fearless at heart, the most diverse and educated generation in our history who the nation is waiting to follow. Because Selma shows us that America is not the project of any one person. Because the single most powerful word in our democracy is the word we. We the people. We shall overcome. Yes, we can. That word is owned by no one. It belongs to everyone. Oh, what a, what a glorious task we are given to continually try to improve this great nation of ours. 50 years from Bloody Sunday, our march is not yet finished, but we're getting closer. 239 years after this nation's founding, our union is not yet perfect, but we are getting closer. Our job's easier because somebody already got us through that first mile. Somebody already got us over that bridge. When it feels the road's too hard, when the torch we've been passed feels too heavy, we will remember these early travelers and draw strength from their example and hold firmly to the words of the prophet Isaiah. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on the wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. We honor those who walked so we could run. We must run so our children soar and we will not grow weary. For we believe in the power of an awesome God, and we believe in this country's sacred promise. May he bless those warriors of justice no longer with us, and bless the United States of America. Thank you, everybody. We are back on A Promised Land, uh, presidential memoir, uh, book series edition of the Thinking Out Loud radio show. And again, I'm so very excited about the opportunity to discuss uh, President Obama's newest book, A Promised Land. We said before the break, we're going to be uh, continuing our discussion uh, during this segment talking about the first black family. And I'm when you think about the first black family, the first black family, when you consider uh, that the Obamas were the first black family to live in the White House, a house that was built by slaves. It is a very significant footnote in American history. Uh, think about it. This this house, this historic house was built uh, between 1792 and 1800. Um, according to history, when Thomas Jefferson moved into the house in 1801, he uh, uh, Added on uh, the low colonnades on each wing that concealed stables and storage. And in 1814, during uh, the War of 1812, the mansion was set ablaze by the British Army uh, in the burning of Washington, destroying the interior and charring much of the exterior. Uh, reconstruction began almost immediately, and President James Monroe moved into the partially reconstructed executive residence in October of 1817. It goes on to say exterior construction continued with the addition of this uh, semicircular south portico in 1824 and the north portico in 1829. Think about this, guys. More than a century later and 43 presidents later, the first black family took residence at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, a house that has been the residence of every American president since John Adams. This is truly, truly historic and remarkable. Uh, just think about the optics of, 
you know, the Obamas being the first black family to take residence in this house uh, that slaves built. And this this fact was not lost on them at all. They talked about it uh, frequently in interviews uh, when asked about, you know, what it means uh, for them uh, or means to them to be to be living uh, in this most historic house, uh, the house of uh, where all of the American presidents have lived. And they always said that it was that it was an honor. It was a privilege. It was a humbling experience for them uh, living in this place. And it's something they wanted to constantly remind their daughters of uh, because they are students of history as well. And uh, that this house and this, and, and this office is not something that should be taken for granted. Um, you know, the first black family in the White House was another one of the first that the Obamas realized once President Obama was inaugurated on June 20 of 2009. And President Obama's historic inauguration uh, as our nation's first black president was a realization of his answer to his wife, Michelle. We talked about this earlier uh, in last week's show when uh, she asked the question, why you? And he said, when I raise my hand to take the oath of office, young black boys and girls will look at themselves differently. And he understood that. He knew that uh, being the first black president uh, will cause or should cause a ripple effect throughout this country, throughout black America, uh, and and cause uh, young people to see themselves differently. The glass ceiling would be shattered uh, when it comes to uh, race in America. And, and black people now can aspire to be uh, the commander in chief and the leader of the free world. It's just truly, uh, truly remarkable when you think about the optics of the the first black family being digitally transported into the lives of black people around the country and the globe was extraordinary. I mean, seeing them in magazines, not just Ebony magazine, but seeing them in People magazine and USA Today and the Washington Post and uh, and and the New York Times together as a black family, not just representing black America, but representing America, representing this country around the world was truly significant um and uh, and 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 seeing that those images, uh, Black America now had representation in the highest office in America, and strong Black and a strong Black family became a symbol of our culture and our heritage. A strong Black family in the White House was a, what became a, a a strong symbol of our culture and our heritage, and and this was the the message that would resonate around. Around the around the globe, uh, seeing the Obamas in the White House—it's just truly amazing, guys. I, I I want you to take a minute and really think about it and digest it. We're we're kind of you know uh, uh, reflecting upon uh, a very significant uh, period in history, and not just in Black America, but in American history, because you know uh, President Obama served in office uh, from 2009 until uh, 2009. 2016 and uh, during that period of time I mean we had a very significant presence uh, in this country um, and and it's one that should not be uh, taken lightly nor taken for granted um, and you know when you saw President Obama and First Lady Obama together they symbolize everything that it means to be unapologetically black and that's one thing that I appreciated about uh, Obama's candidacy uh, that others might not have as much. And I'll, I'll tell you why. You know, I believe that President Obama understood that being black is uh, isn't necessarily something that needs to be said or overstated. 
uh, you know, it, it's not something that constantly needs to be force fed to the American people. We already know that he's a black man. You know, black is, was, and always will be his identity. And there's nothing that he or anyone else can do to change that. So there's no better way to be black than to simply be black. Let me say that again. There's no better way than to be black than to simply be black. Uh, he didn't have to wear a dashiki. He didn't have to wear, uh, you know, an afro with the with with the pick and the, with the fist in it <laughs> to to express his blackness. Even though, you know, some would say that uh, at times throughout his presidency he was not black enough. Um, yeah, there's degrees to blackness. Believe believe it or not, it, it it is. And 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 they were saying that that Obama was not black enough. Even though we said in our previous show that we thought he would be his blackest in his second term because uh, he was not going to be running for reelection. This was his last term in office and he could be himself uh, or be more of himself or be more black. Uh, if you, if you want to use that term, you want to you know be more black or be his blackest, uh, you know unapologetically. Uh, during that time, uh, he could without any repercussions. Being black is undeniably, unequivocally, and unapologetically who we are. But as I said earlier, for some, Obama wasn't black enough. They expected. They expected him to uh, to to express his blackness more overtly, openly, boldly, and publicly, but not so. Now, he chose to be more strategic, uh, diplomatic, and intelligent when it came to expressing his blackness during his eight years uh, in office. And, you know, he was smart about it in so many words. He was smart about how to uh, to to express his blackness. And, you know, there were there were moments throughout his presidency where you saw that we talked about it during the last show when, um, you know, uh, Trayvon Martin was killed. And, you know, he had a press conference to talk about police brutality and to talk about the inequities that exist uh, in, 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 uh, in race in America. Uh, he talked about it in his book, um, uh, uh, Dr. Um, when the, the, the professor, uh, Dr. Henry Louis Gates, uh, when he was accosted in his own home by a Boston police officer and uh, he had to show ID ID in his own home uh, to verify and confirm that he lived there. And uh, you all remember President Obama made a comment at a press conference regarding this and said that the the officer acted stupidly. And um, and that caused a backlash. And then he had to, you know, uh, white America uh, almost uh, I want I don't want to say forced, but uh, uh, pushed him to uh, apologize for those comments. And um, and he brought. Dr. Henry Louis Gates and the the the, uh, the Boston police officer together for sort of like a a beer summit. They called it playfully at the uh, at the White House with him, Joe Biden, and the two gentlemen that um, that uh, were at odds with each other. But you know, so so he had his some he had some black moments and and those were some of the things that that we were privy to uh, during his eight years in the White House. But uh, he understood the office. He understood the gravity of the office. He understood who he was and he also understood the parameters from which he had to work. Uh, but not to get too far off into this, because this segment really is dealing with the black family and how the images and the optics of the black family resonated throughout uh, this country and the world and the impact of those images and, and, and how it influenced uh, young black boys and young black girls uh, and how, uh, you know, it it 
it caused them to see themselves uh, differently. The closest uh, equivalence that I could come up with for this kind of for this moment uh, would probably be the Cosby Show. The Cosby's on the primetime uh, TV back in the 80s. I know you all remember the Cosby Show. We all watched it on Thursdays, uh, Thursday nights at 8 o'clock. You know, Dr. Heathcliff Huxtable, Claire Huxtable, uh, Lawyer Sandra, uh, Denise, Theo, Vanessa, and Rudy were the family, an affluent upper middle class black family living in Brooklyn, New York. The father was a doctor, the mother was a lawyer, the children were all decent and respectful. Respectable. This was black America's fictional first black family for a very long time. You know, this is who we saw. Uh, this was the mirror image of what we could possibly be. We could potentially be, um, you know, when we sat down and watched them on Thursdays uh, at 8 p.m. on uh, NBC. I mean, I remember it very vividly watching Dr. Huxtable and Claire uh, uh, together as they, you know, brought their children up. Their children grew up in front of us uh, and you know, and we were brought into their their lives on Thursday. And again, this was uh, this was the fictional first black family for many of us, uh, uh, you know, coming up. And this is what we saw. And uh, and it wasn't until, um, you know, the Obama's came on the scene and and showed us what uh what 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 life could really be like because this was not fiction here this was non-fiction this was happening in real life in real time unfolding right before our very eyes and it was truly truly phenomenal it was remarkable the images of these of this affluent family this positive and optimistic family inspirational family standing uh, in the front of this historic edifice where slaves built uh, from the ground up and and they understood the historicity of it and yet they uh, were projecting these images around the country and the world for people to see how far we the Obamas in the White House was a melodic crescendo of hundreds of years of black slavery and black struggle that culminated in the inauguration of our nation's first black president and the culmination of our nation's first black family. A melodic crescendo because they stand on the shoulders of men and women that struggle uh, for freedom, that struggle for the right to vote, that struggle uh, for uh, the right to, to be treated equally. And we're still in the midst of this struggle. Things have not, um, you know, things are not where we want them to be. It's very obvious coming off the heels of this four years, these last four years that that we as a country we as as a nation we as a community still have a ways to go and um you know we just celebrated mlk day a day of reflection a day of service and yet uh when we look at where we are as a country we still have a ways to go in in achieving the goals that i believe dr king has outlined for not just our community but for our entire country and um but this is where we are you know this is where we are the first black family and the cosbys were the fictional first black family and the obamas were the uh real life a version of the first black family and one that, uh, you know, again, has left an indelible mark on us, not just as a community, but just but us as a country and uh, for the entire world. Guys, I'm just thrilled about the opportunity to talk about these this amazing family uh, and all that they were able to accomplish, uh, you know, and uh, and share this with you on this platform that we 
we call the Thinking Out Loud radio show. I'm looking forward to chopping it up with you, the listeners of the Thinking Out Loud radio show at 930. We're calling it the after show on Instagram. Follow us at TOL Radio Host MSN. We're looking to hear from you. Well, guys, we want to take our next break of the night. When we come back, we're going to be talking about the worldview of the first black president of these United States. You don't want to go anywhere. You're tuned in to one of the hottest radio shows online. It's the Thinking Out Loud radio. You're listening to the Thinking Out Loud radio show with Pastor Michael Nimmons. Don't you dare touch that dial. Demiree Graphics. In need of a logo design for your business, then check out Demiree Graphics. Need flyers, business cards, t-shirts, or website for your business, then check out Demiree Graphics. The people at Demiree Graphics will get you right for your next business venture. They're professional, creative, courteous, and they get the job done right every time. Check out the team at Demiree Graphics. Give them a call today at 734 219 Five two six six. Demiree Graphics, bringing your imagination to life. Congratulations to Pastor Michael Nimmons for over twenty thousand streams and downloads. Rate, review, and subscribe to the Thinking Out Loud radio show podcast. Available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Radio.com, and MichaelNimmons.com. Tune in today. The Thinking Out Loud radio show. Giving voice to issues that matter to you. Thinking Out Loud swag is here. T-shirts, polos, hoodies, letterman's jackets, and even face masks. All priced affordably and in a variety of colors and sizes. Just visit michaelnimmons.com to purchase your favorite Thinking Out Loud radio show swag. Get yours today and rep the show out loud. have spoken from Minneapolis, Minnesota to London, England, from New Zealand to New York City. Black Lives Matter and I Can't Breathe are the sentiment of people around the world. Dr. King was right. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We must do everything we can to continue to march, protest, and rally for justice. Let us march on until victory is won. An important message from the Thinking Out Loud radio show. You're listening to the Thinking Out Loud radio show with Pastor Michael Nimmons. Don't you dare touch that dial. You're tuned in to the Thinking Out Loud radio show. Keep it locked, keep it locked, keep it locked. That we have duties to ourselves, our nation, and the world. Duties that we do not grudgingly accept, but rather seize gladly. Firm in the knowledge that there is nothing so satisfying to the spirit, so defining of our character, and giving our all to a difficult task. This is the price and the promise of citizenship. This is the source of our confidence. The knowledge that God calls on us to shape an uncertain destiny. 
This is the meaning of our liberty and our creed, why men and women and children of every race and every faith can join in celebration across this magnificent mall. Why a man whose father less than 60 years ago might not have been served at a local restaurant can now stand before you to take a most sacred oath. Let us mark this day with remembrance of who we are and how far we have traveled. In the year of America's birth, in the coldest of months, a small band of patriots huddled by dying campfires on the shores of an icy river. The capital was abandoned. The enemy was advancing. The snow was stained with blood. The moment when the outcome of our revolution was most in doubt, the father of our nation ordered these words be read to the people. Let it be told to the future world that in the depth of winter, when nothing but hope and virtue could survive, that the city and the country, alarmed at one common danger, came forth to meet it. America, in the face of our common dangers, in this winter of our hardship, let us remember these timeless words. With hope and virtue, let us brave once more the icy currents and endure what storms may come. Let it be said by our children's children that when we were tested, we refused to let this journey end, that we did not turn back nor did we falter. And with eyes fixed on the horizon and God's grace upon us, we carried forth that great gift of freedom and delivered it safely to future generations. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America. We are back on the a promised land presidential memoir book series edition of the thinking out loud radio show and i hope you're enjoying our discussion on tonight and uh, we're looking forward to you guys participating in the after show live discussion we plan to have on instagram in just a little bit at 9 30 remember to follow us at tol radio host msn to get your thoughts and uh opinions uh in and chime in about this uh powerful discussion we're having about the first black president of the United States. And I think it's important uh, to talk about this because we're on the cusp of yet another administration. In just a day or so, we're going to be uh, inaugurating uh, President-elect Joe Biden and President and Vice President-elect Vi- uh, Kamala Harris into office. It will be the end of the worst four years of uh, American history, and hopefully uh, better days are ahead. I believe that they are. And so So this is a great discussion to have, and I look forward to having it with you in just a few minutes. Again, follow us at TO World Radio host MSN on Instagram so you can join in the live discussion we plan to have about a promised land and much more. But as we said before the break, we're going to be talking uh, in this segment about the world's view of uh, the first black president of the United States, the world's view of the first black president of the United States. And it's important to know that because uh, the world's view of uh, black America is much different than uh, America's view of black America. Uh, you can go back and in, in look in history and see there are stark differences in how the world looked at the civil rights movement and what took place in Selma and what took place uh, in in um, in various uh States and parts of the South during the Civil Rights Movement, the world's view of what was happening and America's view of what was happening. The world was more sympathetic of the plight of black America uh, and has always been more sympathetic of the plight of black America than its own country, the country that we live in. 
and uh, and you I mean you don't have to uh, go that far back uh, to to see that played out I mean think about the George Floyd protest that took place not just in this country but around the world and we talked about this in uh, in some of our earlier episodes uh, you know we talked about this back in June of 2020 that you know the George Floyd protests were not just happening in cities and states around this country but there were there were protests taking place in Berlin Germany in 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 uh in Paris France and London England and there's footage of these massive protests and they're shouting his name George Floyd you know uh I can't breathe I just and it is remarkable uh the the the, the world's view of black America and uh, versus America's view of uh, the plight of black America. And you, when you read President Obama's book, A Promised Land, you see this uh, very evidently played out uh, not in him just becoming the, the first black president of the United States, but also in running for uh, the highest office in this country and uh, there was a point in his campaign he realized along with his staff that he had very little foreign policy experience and so as a way to kind of show up that experience they uh, planned a nine day foreign policy trip it was a trip that he took with his campaign staff and a couple of veteran senators overseas to test his foreign policy on the world stage and do, as he says, to uh, show what a new era of American leadership uh, would look like. And I think it was a brilliant strategy because if you think about it, uh, President George W. Bush, who was the president at the time while Barack was running for president, uh, had 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 boggled, uh, you know, America's credibility around the world. And if you remember, he was uh, one of uh, the only sitting presidents that ever was embarrassed this way on uh, foreign soil. If you remember, it was President George W. Bush that was, I believe, in Iraq uh, and uh, during the time of the Iraq war, and he was giving a press conference, and I believe it was one of the journalists who threw not one shoe, but two shoes at this American president during a press conference. And that visual, that visual is still in my head. I watched that, and this man dodged both shoes. And this was uh, highly embarrassing for a sitting American president. And at the time, they said that this this journalist who threw these shoes at him was, were going was going to be punished and and whatnot. But turns out uh, that did not happen. In fact, they had a parade for this man because. Uh, of how uh, the country viewed this American president. And it just goes to show you how the credibility of this country had had dwindled uh, significantly under uh, the, the, the leadership of President George W. Bush. And so, as I said earlier, uh, Barack Obama wanted to show what new American leadership would look like if he became president. And so they planned this nine day foreign trip where, uh, you know, he uh, he went to uh, Germany and met with Angela Merkel. And he spoke to an audience of 250,000 people gathered in front of Berlin's historic victory column. Any candidate garnering that kind of attention on the world stage is someone to be reckoned with. I remember watching that. And I thought the number had been exaggerated. But when they showed the people and president or candidate Senator at the time, Barack Obama, speaking to an audience of 250,000 people. 
it is extremely, extremely remarkable. Uh, you know the, the the response he got as a candidate running for president of the United States, and to me that was one of the uh, the moments where I I thought to myself that this man is going to win. There's no question in my mind that when you go to Germany and you command an audience of 250,000 people who are not Americans, who are Germans, to listen to you, then you, you, you've, you, this is going to be the next president of the United States. And that was actually one of the moments that I really believed strongly that he was going to win. And I was right. Um, and 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 this was just one of a few of those kinds of moments. Uh, he also says in his book, while in Israel visiting the holy city in Jerusalem, it was accustomed to kneel and pray before the limestone wall filled with other people's handwritten prayers that were placed in the cracks of the walls. And and uh, Senator Barack Obama at the time had written a prayer of his own that he pushed deep into the crevice of the wall that read, Lord, protect my family and me. Forgive my sins and help me guard against pride and despair. Give me the wisdom to do what is right and what is just. Make me an instrument of your will. And the reason we are able not we are able to not only read this is not just because it was written in between the pages of Barack's book or uh, President Obama's book A Promised Land but he talked about after leaving that wall that someone retrieved his prayer from within the crevices of the wall that he intentionally thought he pressed deep into the wall where it could not be retrieved and it was retrieved and it was reported uh, in the news what Obama's prayer was it goes to show you just how um, much attention that his candidacy got while running for president of the United States and those are just two examples there's even a speech uh, he talks about in his book uh, A Promised Land where uh, this is one of his um, you know first speeches he gave as president of the United States overseas in uh, in Egypt in fact he was in Cairo and he discussed this in his book he just uh, the trip to Cairo uh, where he delivered a historic speech on Islam in an effort to ease American tensions toward Muslim and it, Muslims and Islam in a post 9-11 society. This speech was delivered at the University of Cairo and he opened the speech with a traditional Muslim greeting. Uh, I want to play a little bit of that speech for you uh, right now. Take a listen. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you. Shukran. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. I am honored to be in the timeless city of Cairo and to be hosted by two remarkable institutions. For over a thousand years, Ulazar has stood as a beacon of Islamic learning. And for over a century, Cairo University has been a source of Egypt's advancement. And together, you represent the harmony between tradition and progress. I'm grateful for your hospitality and the hospitality of the people of Egypt. 
And I'm also proud to carry with me the goodwill of the American people and a greeting of peace from Muslim communities in my country. Assalamu alaikum. And just imagine, you know, how uh, those students in uh, at the University of Cairo felt to be greeted by an American president using uh, a traditional Muslim or Islamic greeting, assalamu alaikum, uh, that uh, they're probably used to hearing uh, from, you know, their own leaders in Egypt and the Muslim world. And here you have an American president evoking the same Islamic gesture uh, as an opening for his speech. I mean, that, that, that I'm sure carried a lot of weight and, uh, you know, showed a bit of goodwill on behalf of the United States of America. And that was the kind of president that uh, Obama was and uh, one that I'm sure we all appreciated. I ran across something very interesting uh, yesterday doing MLK Day uh, on Instagram from Pete Souza, uh, the uh, photographer, the presidential photographer for uh, then President Barack Obama uh, that he shared on his Instagram feed. Uh, and it was uh, a, a letter, uh, the handwritten letter that uh, President Obama left to uh, then President Donald Trump uh, two days uh, before. For him leaving office, he left it in one of his desk uh, drawers in the Resolute Desk, and it reads as follows Dear Mr. President, congratulations on a remarkable run. Millions have placed their hopes in you, and all of us, regardless of party, should hope for expanded prosperity and security during uh, during your tenure. This is a unique office without a clear blueprint for success. So I don't know that any advice from me will be particularly helpful. Still, let me offer a few reflections from the past eight years. First, we've both been blessed in different ways with great good fortune. Not everyone is so lucky. It's up to us to do everything we can to build more ladders and ladders of success for every child and family that's willing to work hard. Secondly, American leadership in the world really is indispensable. It's up to us through action and example to sustain the international order that's expanded steady since the end of the Cold War and upon which our own wealth and safety depend. Third, we are just temporary occupants of this office that makes us guardians of those democratic institutions and traditions like rule of law, separation of powers, equal protection and civil liberties that our forebears fought and bled for. Regardless of the push and pull of daily politics, it's up to us to leave those institutions of our democracy at least as strong as we found them. And finally, take time in the rush of events and responsibilities for friends and family. They'll get you through the inevitable rough pit, rough patches. Michelle and I wish you and Melania the very best as you embark on this great adventure and know that we stand ready to help in any way in which we can. Good luck and Godspeed, Barack Obama. Now that was the kind of president that we had in the person of Barack Obama. A very thoughtful, a very inspiring and introspective uh, president, a sharp contrast to the president that preceded him in Donald Trump and one that we can't wait to say goodbye to in the next day or so. (laughs) <laughs> and think about the gravitas and the graciousness of President Barack Obama in the in light of the fact that the Democratic Party lost 
uh, the election to the Republicans and Donald Trump back in 2016, he was still gracious enough to open up the doors of the White House and invite this president in and his wife, who, mind you, uh, were, were a constant critic of Obama's throughout his entire presidency. Trump was the leader of the Bertha movement that questioned Obama's legitimacy as president and trying to say that he was not an American citizen, that he was Kenyan born and and basically forced this man to show his birth certificate and prove that he was a citizen of this country and thereby credit, uh, thereby worthy of the office of president of the United States. In spite of all of that, President Obama was still yet gracious enough to open up the doors of the White House and invite this man uh, in there and to offer him and extend him kindness and courtesy uh, in spite of how he might have been treated the past eight years. A tremendous, a remarkable, remarkable uh, American president and a human being, uh, to say the least. And there are many, many, many more examples that we could uh, talk about and discuss during this segment. We're going to save it for the after show. I'm looking forward to talking to you, the listeners of Thinking Out Loud radio show, in just a little bit at 930 live on Instagram. So we'll save it for then. But we're going to take our next break of the night. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the next black president. I'm excited about this topic, guys. So don't go anywhere. Where you tuned in to the Thinking Out Loud radio show. We'll be right back. This is Michael Eric Dyson, and when I'm in Detroit, I listen to the Thinking Out Loud radio show, dropping that knowledge, giving that inspiration, giving us that enlightenment. Nobody does it like Brother Michael does it. Do your thing. Holla. Peace. The Thinking Out Loud radio show giving voice to issues that matter to you. Don't, 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 don't touch that dial. It's the Thinking Out Loud radio show. We'll be right back. Thinking Out Loud swag is here. T-shirts, polos, hoodies, letterman's jackets, and even face masks. All priced affordably and in a variety of colors and sizes. Just visit michaelnimmons.com to purchase your favorite Thinking Out Loud radio show swag. Get yours today and rep the show out loud. All pro football player Derek Mason on Jay Z in the NFL. Jay Z said, you know, we're past milling. Because Jay Z, you may be past milling, but the guys that are still milling, the guys that are still fighting for injustice, they're not past milling. Everybody's screaming that, oh, Jay Z's at the table now. We should be happy that one of us is at the table. Just because you're at the table doesn't mean we all eat the same. Poet and lyricist Ty Scott King on the culture of CHH. My brain is overloaded. Like, I think a lot of people are like, man, there's not really many people doing this. There are thousands of very amazing artists that are doing Christian hip hop. So I think about Aaron Cole. I think about Stephen Malcolm, who is there someone that could hear an interview and be like, I want to work with him. Like, he would be a person that I, I would love to work with. He's just a phenomenal rapper, just really creative. One day, she's another one that, uh, another artist that I had on my radio show. She is, um, Juan Day is maybe in her early 20s. She's doing a lot of stuff now with Reach Records and just really different, <laughs> really um, going against the grain. Griff from Get Up Mornings with Erica Campbell on what he does besides comedy. Yeah, yeah. Comedy is always my first, my first job. Radio is my side job, but I just um, got a nonprofit. I've been working with other people's nonprofits for the last 30 years. Um, and I just created my own nonprofit, 501c3, called the Process Success Foundation to deal with leadership. And basically, I'm just going to take a bunch of young men on field trips all around the world. And I can show you how during the NHL season, 
that all basketball stadiums have ice on them with the hardwood over the ice. Once I show you those processes, then I can teach you the process of forgiveness. I can teach you the process of love. I can teach you the process of being grateful. We bring you the best minds who deliver their best thoughts only on the Thinking Out Loud radio show. Vision should be the next book you purchase. Written by radio host and minister Michael Nimitz. Vision is an insightful, thought-provoking book that is also a helpful tool in getting you to see your life through God's eyes. Vision Endorsed by best-selling authors Dr. Eddie Connor and Kim Brooks and mega-pastor Bishop Charles H. Ellis III. Vision is a life-changing book that you need in your personal library. Get your copy today. Available everywhere books are sold online or at michaelnimmons.com. Get your copy today. Vision. Vision. Stay tuned for more motivation, more inspiration, and more empowerment on the Thinking Out Loud radio show. Keep it locked. If there is anyone out there who still doubts that America is a place where all things are possible, who still wonders if the dream of our founders is alive in our time, who still questions the power of our democracy, tonight is your answer. It's the answer told by lines that stretched around schools and churches in numbers this nation has never seen, by people who waited three hours and four hours, many for the first time in their lives, because they believed that this time must be different, that their voices could be that difference. It's the answer spoken by young and old, rich and poor, Democrat and Republican, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, gay, straight, disabled and not disabled, Americans who sent a message to the world that we have never been just a collection of individuals or a collection of red states and blue states. We are and always will be the United States of America. Well, guys, we are back on a promised land presidential memoir book series edition of the Thinking Out Loud radio show. And I hope you have been enjoying this two week discussion of President Obama's newest book, A Promised Land. Again, this has been a book series, a book rather that I have been waiting uh, to get as, as, you know, as as soon as he left office. This was definitely uh, a book that I wanted to read um, and. Uh, one that I'm thoroughly enjoying. I haven't completely finished it yet. I'm about, uh, you know, a little over two thirds of the way through. I uh, should be done in the next few days or so. But it is a very interesting read. This is the first volume of what he's calling his presidential memoirs. And uh, it goes up into the first four years of his presidency of this country. And I'm enjoying it. I really am. And I'm really enjoying the opportunity to be able to discuss this book on our podcast. Again, if you missed last week's show, you can go back to uh, our website, michaelnemons.com, or you can catch it on any of the podcasting networks, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn. Uh, the Detroit Praise Network has our uh, podcast as well, Apple Podcast, uh, you know, radio.com. It's a number of places that you can find the Thinking Out Loud radio show podcast available 
online. So we love to get your thoughts and feedback about that. And again, I'm looking forward to chopping it up with our listeners about this book and Obama's legacy uh, during the after show at 930 on Instagram. So I'm looking forward to it. And I hope you are as well. And as I said before the break, uh, we're going to be talking about the topic of the next black president. Again, uh, the next black president, because I don't believe that uh, Obama is going to be the only black president that this country ever has. I, I It's hard for me to believe that even though reality says might say otherwise, because we have up until this point only had of the 45 presidents that have uh, set in the Oval Office, only one of them have looked like us. Uh, reality says that it might be another 45 presidents before we get to that point. But I, I, I choose not to believe that. I choose to be more idealistic and, and uh, optimistic about the prospects of us having another black president. In fact, uh, when you think about this new administration that we're getting ready to um, that's getting ready to be inaugurated uh, on Wednesday, January 20th, uh, President elect Joe Biden and uh, Vice President elect Kamala Harris, President uh, Biden, I believe, is 78 years old or so, somewhere around there. Uh, and then you have Vice President elect Kamala Harris, who is a African American Asian Pacific woman, uh, the first vice, the first of um, uh, first woman, first Asian Pacific African American woman, Vice President of this country, and here we are. Uh, you know the the you know the 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 optics of this administration. You know having the first African American woman uh, in this position ever is another first for the Democratic Party, and one that we should be excited about. Uh, but it's also one that um, I believe is a part of the reason that we've gotten so much pushback from uh, the conspiracy theorists uh, and those who would like to say that the election was stolen, primarily because, uh, you know, they uh, with this particular ticket um, and because of uh, Joe Biden's age and voting for him would be essentially voting for in some respects, the next black president. Uh, the great thing about the Democratic Party, and I was talking to someone about this uh, earlier, is the, the, you know, they're the ones that seem to have given us candidates that have uh, expanded our imagination, have allowed us to see, uh, a, a given us a vision for this country that that um, that that's opened us up to more possibilities, you know. It was a Democratic Party that gave us uh, Barack Obama. It was a Democratic Party that gave us uh, Vice President-elect uh, Kamala Harris. And so I believe that is going to be this Democratic Party that will give us the next black president. If it's Kamala Harris or someone else. I believe that uh, that is potentially possible that it, that 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 the next black president is not going to be 40 presidents down the road, but it could very well be four or five presidents from now. Who knows? But, uh, you know, one thing that you we can credit the Trump administration with is now more Americans than ever have become engaged in the political process. Uh, you know, whether you like it or not, uh, people are coming out of the wit woodwork. I'm sorry, woodwork and voting. Uh, Stacey Abrams is a young rising star in the Democratic Party. And if not for her, uh, you know, newly elected Senator uh, Reverend uh, Warnack and, and Senator John Ossoff from Georgia would not have been possible uh, with her efforts. Uh, she flipped Georgia blue, not just for the presidential election, but for the Senate runoff. And that is truly remarkable. And so she's a name that is out there. And um, I'm telling you, if I was Governor Kemp, I would be shaking in my boots. 
because uh, you know here here we have someone that they they ran against each other uh, just uh, three or four years ago there about might have been three years ago or so it doesn't seem that long that long ago but uh, you know he I, I see her running again and becoming governor of the state of uh, Atlanta uh, sorry the state of Georgia and um, and then who knows where she's going to go from there. But uh, if I was Governor Kemp, I would be shaking in my boots because she is definitely a rising star in the Democratic Party. Another one is uh, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. He is another brilliant uh, congressman, black, intelligent uh, gentleman uh, that serves um, in uh, the United States Congress and uh, a rising star in the Democratic Party and one that I think will be a formidable opponent for any Republican, uh, you know, vying for uh, the office of congressman uh, and or, you know, he might even have designs on running for president of the United States. And he's definitely someone that is uh, that, um, you know, would would uh, would would be a great candidate and I think a, a, a great president. Another individual, Senator Cory Booker. Uh, he is a brilliant young African American uh, man who ran uh, this last election cycle was uh, not successful in his run but uh, Senator from New Jersey and doing a, a admirable job there in the U.S. Senate and one that uh, should definitely be taken seriously because I don't believe we have seen the last of him in running for president of the United States. Uh, but you have uh, many others. Uh you know, we've heard talks about uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, uh, you know, running for Speaker of the House. Uh, possibly, she's a progressive Democrat, but uh, one that uh, you know her ideas, even though the progressives are somewhat of a minority uh, in uh, in Congress right now. But uh, I could definitely see, uh, you know, some. Of, I could definitely see her ri- uh, becoming a. She's already a rising. Star the Democratic Party, I could see that, uh, you know, uh, her amassing uh, followers uh, in 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 her pursuit of becoming uh, the next Speaker of the House and uh, who potentially could become a uh, vice presidential candidate or even running for president of the United States. There are so many uh, African-Americans, uh, you know, minorities within both the Congress and the Senate that we should be looking at as the next uh, possible candidate and president of the United States. So, guys, um, I think because of the groundwork that President Obama laid uh, laid out and, and the strategies that he put in place in uh, running for president of the United States, he's given a lot of uh, a lot of people, a lot of uh, people that look like us hope and um, promise on the, uh, the potential for them to run for uh, the highest office in the land. So, you know, I, if nothing else, I am optimistic. I am energized. I'm enthused by uh, the potential, the possibilities that are there uh, for the next black president. They may even be listening to this podcast with us on tonight. But guys, uh, we as we must do as uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson said to us back in the 80s, keep hope alive. We've got to continue to do that. We've got to continue to, um, you know, inspire and educate our young black boys and girls about what's happening around them uh, keep them engaged in the in this civic process uh, answer whatever questions they might have about what's going on around them and uh, and and instill in them the right moral values the right uh, the, the, the 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 right things they need to know and and who knows you know your son or daughter might be the next black president of the United States. 
what took place in November uh, should have given us all promise and all of us hope that, uh, you know, our country is not as polarized as uh, we we think it is it, or it's been believed to have been uh, because, um, you know, uh, truth crust to the earth will rise again. And as much as we have been lied to uh, over these past four years, some would think that uh, truth is um, no longer uh, visible, no longer accessible. But it is true. It is accessible. Um, Right is still right and wrong is still wrong. And uh, we still uh, there's still a difference between uh, the truth and a lie. So um, that is, if nothing else, something that we can uh, hold on to, especially within the next coming days of this new administration. And it speaks to the power of words. And, you know, we, we talked about this in a few few shows early on uh, dealing with the presidency. You know, we have a lot of people that look to that office for direction, for guidance and uh, what the president says for a lot of people uh, determines their outlook on life. If the president says that it's going to be a good day, then they believe it's going to be a good day. If the president says that, uh, you know, uh, we can make it, then people begin to believe that we can make it. But if the president says that it's gloomy outside or that it's going to be a bad day, then for many people, they believe it's going to be a bad day. And so we have to uh, not rely our and put our trust and faith in what is said from the Oval Office. But we have to put our faith and our trust in God because he's the one that determines uh, what kind of day we're going to have. The Bible talks about weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. So if nothing else, I think we need to take a lesson from the word of God and not look at uh, the White House or what happens at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue as the end all and be all of what's happening in our lives. But as David said, I will lift up mine eyes to the hills from which cometh my help. All of my help coming from the Lord. I, guys, I'm, a, I'm just thrilled about the opportunity to have shared this series with you. Uh, the a Promised Land book series, Presidential Memoir book series with you these past two episodes. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I'm looking forward to talking with you in just a few minutes uh, during our after show at 930 on Instagram at TOL Radio Host MSN. Guys, Guys, I can't wait to chop it up with you in just a few minutes, and I'm looking forward uh, to hearing what you have to say. Well, guys, we're going to take our last break of the night. But when we come back, we're getting right into our thought of the week. You don't want to go anywhere. You're tuned in to one of the hottest radio shows. You're tuned in to the thinking. Giving voice to issues that matter to you. What's up, everybody? This is your girl, Telly Hampton, coming to you straight from Detroit, Michigan. Right now, I am tuned in with your great host, Michael Nimmons. Make sure you stay locked to the Thinking Out Loud radio show. Tune in to the Thinking Out Loud radio show every Tuesday at 8 p.m. with radio host, Michael Nimmons. Available everywhere you listen to your podcast. And now available for download on the Detroit Praise Network app. Thinking Out Loud swag is here. 
t-shirts, polos, hoodies, letterman's jackets, and even face masks. All priced affordably and in a variety of colors and sizes. Just visit michaelnimmons.com to purchase your favorite Thinking Out Loud radio show swag. Get yours today and rep the show out loud. Who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you were insufficient? Who told you that you were a loser? Who told you that you were a failure? Who told you that you were deficient? Who told you that you were nothing? Who told you that you were worthless? Who told you that you had no value? Who told you that you... To believe. Who Told You That You Were Naked is a dynamic, empowering, and inspiring book about identity that is a definite must-have. Pastor Nimmons talks about an identity crisis that dates as far back as the Garden of Eden. You don't want to miss these powerful insights into not just the problem of this identity crisis, but the discovery of the spiritual solution. Get your copy now, available on Amazon for just $14.95 or by visiting michaelnemons.com. Like a victim when you are already victorious. Hey, what's cracking, Planet Earth? It's your boy Griff, comedian, author, motivational speaker, entrepreneur, philanthropist, but a Jesus Christ lover. You understand me? And you're listening to Thinking Out Loud Radio with my homeboy, Michael Nemeth. Check him out right here. Go ahead, Mike. Give him that good, good. The Thinking Out Loud Radio Show. Giving voice to issues that matter to you. Listening to the Thinking Out Loud Radio Show with Pastor Michael Nimmons. Don't you dare touch that dial. It's time, 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 time for the Thinking Out Loud Radio Show thought, 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 thought of the Week. Tonight, in the spirit of MLK Day and Dr. King, one of the greatest black Americans to ever live, we want to share with you an excerpt of a powerful sermon he delivered entitled Paul's Letter to America. Take a listen. So this morning, I would like to use as a subject Paul's Letter to American Christians. Paul's letter to American Christians. I would like to share with you an imaginary letter from the pen of the Apostle Paul, the postmark. Another thing that disturbs me about your church. You have a Negro church, and you have a white church. Oh, America, that is quite disturbing, for that cannot exist within the true body of Christ. How did that thing ever get into being anyway? You have allowed segregation to come into the church, America. Oh, how tragic. When you stand up on Sunday morning to sing, In Christ there is no east or west, Isn't it tragic that you stand in the most segregated hour of your Christian nation? They tell me there is more integration in sports arenas and nightclubs than that is in the Christian church. Oh, how tragic that is. How appalling that is. They tell me that there are even Christians among you who try to justify segregation on the basis of the Bible. They try to argue that the Negro is inferior by nature 
because of Noah's curse upon the children of Ham, oh, my friends, all oh, America, this is blasphemy. This is against everything that the Christian religion stands for. This is against the will of the Almighty God. In America, I would urge you to get rid of that something called segregation. It is a dangerous evil. It is an evil which must be wiped over the face of the earth if man is ever to come to his full maturity. America, don't compromise with it. Don't play with it. Oh, I praise your Supreme Court for passing a great decision just a year or two ago. And I praise all men in your nation of goodwill who are willing to follow it. But they tell me you still have some brothers among you in Alabama, in Mississippi, in Georgia, in Louisiana, and Florida who would make their legislative calls ring loud with the words interposition and nullification. They have lost the true meaning of democracy and Christianity. And I would urge you to plead with your brothers with patience and understanding goodwill and tell them that this isn't the way. May I say just a word to those of you who are struggling against this evil. Let me say to you to always struggle against it with Christian methods and with Christian weapons. Never succumb to the temptation of becoming bitter. Never succumb to the temptation of indulging in hate campaigns. You must at all moments Move with wise restraint and calm reasonableness. Keep pressing on, but press on with discipline and dignity and use only the weapon of love and let no man pull you so low as to hate him. Look at your oppressor hard enough to see in him something of God's image. Yes, it might be just a spark, but if you work on him long enough, it can develop into a leaping flame. And so I would say to those of you who are warring and struggling against your oppressor to use Christian methods and Christian weapons and let him know that as you struggle, you are not attempting to defeat him, not attempting to humiliate him, not attempting to get rid of, uh, get rid of him or uh, to pay him back. Let him know that you are seeking to help him as well as yourself. Let him know that the festering sword of segregation debilitates the white man as well as the Negro. Let him know that as you seek to rid the earth of this evil of segregation, you're seeking to help him also. Give that message all over the world and live by that principle and get rid of that something called segregation, America. For it is not only rationally inexplicable, but it is morally scandalous. You must get rid of it if you are to be a Christian nation. Yes, America, I realize that some of you will give your lives to this something. There will be white people of goodwill who will do it, and there will be Negroes who will struggle to get rid of it. But I want to say this to you, that as you struggle, don't despair. Realize that whenever you stand up for right and righteousness, Whenever you stand up for truth, whenever you stand up for goodness, you will be persecuted, but don't despair about it. Sometimes it might mean going to jail, but if that is the case, be willing to fill up the jail because I had to go to jail. It might even mean physical death. The physical death is the price that some must pay to free their children from a life of permanent psychological death. Then nothing could be more honorable. Don't worry about the persecutions, America. You are going to have that if you stand up for truth and goodness. Oh, that happened throughout my life. As soon as I was converted, I was denied by the disciples at Jerusalem. Then I was later tried for heresy at Jerusalem. Yes, I was beaten at Thessalonica. I was mobbed at Ephesus. I was jailed at Philippi. And I went down to Athens and I was depressed there. Yes, I was even shipwrecked in Malta. But I'm still going... And I still believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only hope of the world. I still believe that in standing up for the gospel of Jesus, nothing in the world is greater. This is the end of life. This is the end of the universe. The end of the universe is not to be happy. 
The end is not to avoid suffering, but the end of life is to do the will of God, come what may. Oh, America, will you hear that and will you follow that before it is too late? Then I must say one other thing. you enjoyed tonight's start of the week coming from the legendary iconic black leader dr martin luther king jr paul's letter to american christians this is still a message that resonates even on today well guys that's our show for tonight we hope you enjoyed the book the uh, promised land uh, presidential book series uh, that we just recently concluded thank you so much for tuning in to tonight's show this is the end of the podcast but in just a few minutes we're going live on uh, Instagram, the after show uh, at TOL Radio Host MSN. At TOL Radio Host MSN. You can follow us there. We're going to be going live and talking to you about the book, talking to you more about uh, Obama's legacy. We're going to be talking to you about the inauguration that's happening on tomorrow, January the 20th. Uh, you know, what can we expect from the Biden Harris uh, administration uh, starting on tomorrow? So, Guys, I look forward to chopping it up with each and every one of you that are listening on tonight. Share uh, this podcast on your social media as well as the post regarding the after show as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing each and every one of you in just a few minutes live on Instagram. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to the Thinking Out Loud radio show. Your support helps us to increase our exposure across the world wide web. And guys, you don't want to miss next week's show. It's going to be great. We've got the former member of A1 Swift with us uh, on next week's show. Uh, she's performed with the likes of Kurt Franklin, Trinity 5 7, Commission, and many more. And she's got a new single out called Reach. It's a banger. We're going to be sharing it with you during next week's show plus she's got a business that's uh that she's promoting as well entitled unleashed media marketing for those that are looking to expand their reach on social media and much more she's going to be talking about her business her music and more next week uh on the thinking out loud radio show plus she's going to be with us on the after show live on instagram so guys you don't want to miss next week's show it's going to be great i'm telling you so don't miss it well, guys, that's it for tonight's show. We're getting ready to get out of here. We'll see you in a few minutes live on Instagram. And until next time, always remember, if you think it, you can believe it. If you can believe it, you can see it. If you can see it, you can be it. If you can be it, you can achieve it. The power rests within you. The mind is the most powerful muscle in your body. Use what you got to get what you want. The power is in you. It's the Thinking Out Loud radio show. Thanks for listening. Thank you for tuning in to the Thinking Out Loud radio show. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe to the podcast. To get more info about the show and the ministry, visit michaelnemons.com. Want to book radio host Michael Nemons for your next special event? Send an email to contact at michaelnemons.com. Tune in every Tuesday at 8 p.m. for the Thinking Out Loud radio show. Giving voice to issues that matter to you.